Jerusalem, the storied city of David, often destroyed, but always rebuilt. It has been celebrated in song as the mother of mankind. The prophet Ezekiel called it the center of the earth. In and around Jerusalem, across war-ravaged hills, arid desert expanses, lush, fertile valleys and open fields, along the riverbanks and lake shores of Palestine, God elected to make himself manifest in the person of his only begotten Son. And in Jerusalem, the Son of God, a humble man, sacrificed himself for the salvation of mankind. His modest life in Palestine and the pain of his passion in Jerusalem changed the course of civilization. Two thousand years later, the message of his ministry and his triumph over death is still felt around the globe. The church that Jesus Christ founded in this time-weathered land, the church that Peter and Paul and the other apostles took beyond the narrow boundaries of Palestine, still carries on today the essence of life that the Son of Man proclaimed in his ministry. A church, ecclesia, a calling together, a gathering, bringing people together to form a kinonia, a community surviving persecution, oppression, and even desertion, the Church has stayed its course for 20 centuries to remain the faith of the New Testament, forever pronouncing its enduring message of love, agape. Built on the unshakable foundation of tradition, it still clings faithfully to fundamental Christian ethics, preaching the righteousness of God, eternal love, forgiveness and compassion, tolerance and understanding, philanthropia, God's love for humanity. A journey back in history is always an opportunity for reflection. Who we are, what we are, where we are today, depends on where we were yesterday. The uninterrupted chronicles of people and events, custom and worship, the dazzling splendor of colorful ritual and decorum, the radiant treasure of timeless art and architecture, the questioning by the minds of believers and the challenge from the minds of unbelievers, the constant dialectic of debate and decision, the evolution of dogma and doctrine, a vital, vibrant body of faith and beliefs presumed to be valid. All these elements form the individual links of a chain connecting us to our roots and to our heritage. Anchored in the scriptures, this long, unbroken chain of tradition is the brilliant legacy of Eastern Orthodox Christianity.
Ιωδί, ο πανσού του μυστικού, σήμερον η αεθέου κοινωνών με παράλαβε. Μη γαρτής εχθρίσου το μυστήριον ύπο, που φίλοι μας η δώσω καθάπερο The kingdom of God may not know physical bounds, but Christianity cast its early tentative roots in the narrow deserts and valleys that extend along the eastern shores of the Mediterranean Sea. Palestine has appropriately come to be regarded as the cradle of religions. Christ was born just five miles south of Jerusalem, in the village of Bethlehem. But he lived and practiced most of his ministry some 70 miles north of Jerusalem, around the Sea of Galilee, among Hellenized Jews and Gentiles. At Pentecost, 50 days after his glorious resurrection, Jesus, having already ascended to heaven, empowered his disciples with the Holy Spirit. That very day, 3,000 were baptized into the church, and the first Christian community was formed in Jerusalem. Go forth, Christ had commanded his apostles, and make all nations my disciples. First they went to the Jews, but then to Gentiles as well. And what began as a movement inside Palestinian Judaism was transformed within a few centuries into a universal religion. Christianity is forever marked by its Semitic origin, but it grew up in a decidedly Greek world. Jews, firmly in the grip of Roman rule, had long suffered under foreign influence and occupation, clinging to a sense of community, not as much in their political or cultural achievements as in the rich heritage of their religious life and tradition. This Old Testament Judaic heritage of fellowship, philanthropy, and belief in one God provided fertile ground for the message of Jesus. On the other hand, Rome had expanded its domain across the Mediterranean basin. Its military and commercial presence sustained three centuries of relative stability and peace, Pax Romana. The Romans contributed a framework of law and order, as well as freedom of travel and commercial trade routes, the practical means by which ideas could spread. But it was the Greek language that served as the catalyst in propagating the Christian gospel. It was an advanced Hellenic culture and Greek classical thought that supplied the necessary climate for Christianity to actually take root and flourish. The sprawling conquests of Alexander the Great in the 4th century before Christ had spread Greek civilization to all corners of the known world. Greek had become the international language of the times, providing the means by which abstract ideas became universally intelligible. The rise of the Roman Empire did not change matters. Roman leaders spoke Greek as well as Latin, and the Roman Church celebrated its mass in Greek, not Latin, well into the third century AD. 
classical Greek philosophy had also gained a secure foothold in all territories of the Roman conquest. Immortality of the soul, as proposed by Socrates. Superiority of mind and reason over matter and the senses. Plato's concept that ideas or forms represented an eternal, unchanging reality behind ever-changing appearances. Aristotelian logic, a systematic reasoning from a premise to inevitable conclusion. Ethics, a distinction between right and wrong, good and evil. The notion of duty and self-improvement promoted by the Stoics. All these ideas dominated the thinking of the era. In fact, Neoplatonic scholars, especially in Alexandria and Damascus, exerted tremendous influence on contemporary thought from the 3rd century BC well into the 4th and 5th centuries AD. Subscribing to the fundamentally Greek perception of logos, the word, or nous, mind and reason, as a supreme force, a moving spirit regulating the universe. With only a few exceptions, they were content to accept and promote the Christian concept of a divine spirit as an eternal power permeating the world. Christianity inherited a distinctly Jewish moral predisposition for philanthropy to feed the poor, care for the sick, and provide for the deprived. From Greek civilization, it took and radically altered Platonic ideals of immortality and perfection, Aristotelian logic, and the system of values developed by the Stoics, giving them new content and meanings. The fusion of the Gospel's message with the charity of Judaism and with the reason of classical Greece created the essence of humanity, which even today resides at the very core of Orthodox Christianity. Christian morality of love, compassion, and sacrifice struck responsive hearts. Its message of salvation, promising life eternal after death, fell on receptive minds. And the inclusivity of this new religion, its intimacy and sense of belonging, attracted alienated souls. The predominantly pagan populations in rural areas felt threatened by the Christian rejection of pagan gods whose favor they believed brought success to the empire. Loyal Roman citizens in urban centers resented Christian indifference for imperial or military service. Worse yet, government didn't take kindly to Christians renouncing the emperor's divinity. Their preaching of a new king suggested revolution, if not treason. In such an environment, hospitable to fundamental Christian beliefs, but hostile to their apparent consequences, Christianity took its first tentative steps to enlighten civilization and to transform and build cultures. St. Paul, a Greek-speaking Jew, with the distinct advantage of full Roman citizenship, in fact, once a zealous persecutor of Christianity, became its most passionate convert and missionary. He set out to attract the masses to what he called the body of Christ. In four consecutive journeys, strenuous enough to have broken a man of lesser faith, often at risk, St. Paul touched Jews and Gentiles alike. His ministry met with either acceptance or rejection, never indifference. At Philippi, he baptized Lydia, the first Christian convert on the European continent. Immediately thereafter, he was arrested, whipped, and imprisoned. Miraculously, he escaped.
At Arios Pagos, beneath the shadow of the Parthenon, he came to preach to the Athenians about their unknown God. Mocked and ridiculed by skeptical elders of a former power in decline, he remained undaunted. In the span of 13 years, St. Paul traveled almost 15,000 miles, by boat, but mostly on foot, establishing churches across the empire. The apostle of the Gentiles, he took Christianity out of the narrow confines of the Jewish synagogue and into the world. The church and its growth followed commercial and political centers across the dominions of Rome. The empire, after all, especially in its eastern part, had been an empire of cities. In the first generation of Christians, administrative authority rested in the hands of the apostles. However, once a church was established, an apostle, before moving on in his mission, would appoint elders to oversee the affairs of each community. By gradual evolution, there emerged an administrative structure with threefold ministries. Deacons, attendants to perform community services, presbyters or elders, to assist in the administration of the community and its worship, episcopi, the overseers, or bishops to preside over the church in each city. By the second century, such a church hierarchy had been clearly established. Each city had an ordained bishop, an episcopos, tracing themselves to an apostle. To this day, countless episcopal seats in the Orthodox family claim such an unbroken tradition of apostolic succession. By a laying on of hands upon ordination of a bishop, authority passed directly from an apostle to the bishop and to each of his successors thereafter. The expansion of the church during these formative years was neither spontaneous nor trouble-free. Its seeds were nourished by the blood of martyrs. Martyrdom and persecution awaited at every single crossroad. Emperor Nero used Christians as living torches to illuminate his gardens at night. And sporadic waves of persecution erupted in practically every corner of the empire. Despite periods of tolerance, during its first three centuries, Christianity remained a religion expressly forbidden and oppressed by the government. There were even state-sanctioned outbursts of general persecution when worship of Christ was punished by death. The Great Persecution, launched by Emperor Diocletian at the turn of the 4th century, ordered destruction of all church buildings, confiscation of Christian books, dismissal of Christians from government or military positions, and imprisonment of all clergy. During such times, Christians had no place to go. They had to take their church underground to dark tunnels, the catacombs, where they usually buried their dead. These caves were the first churches, the first altars, the first schools, that helped Christians sustain their faith and keep the flame alive.
Tradition has it that Emperor Constantine saw a vision of the cross of Christ with the inscription, En tuto nika, in this you conquer. As he prepared for battle to consolidate his claim on the Roman throne in the year 312 AD, Constantine used the cross to rally his army and subsequently changed the course of Christendom and human civilization as well. Inspired by his vision, victorious in battle, Constantine became a protector of the Christian faith. He came to be known as Constantine the Great, and with his mother Helen was recognized by Orthodox Christianity as one of its greatest saints and benefactors. The Edict of Milan, a decree issued soon after Constantine emerged as the sole emperor, put an end to Emperor Diocletian's great persecution, granting Christians full freedom to worship. It transformed Christianity from the Church of the Catacombs to the Church of the Empire. Religion had long been integrated into Roman society. After all, like all other states of the era, the Roman Empire was based on religion. Constantine, in pursuit of the elusive Roman ideal for one state, one society, one ideology, saw in the communion of Christianity an opportunity to unify his empire. He imagined a single, powerful realm, imitating on earth the kingdom of heaven. In the year 324 AD, recognizing that Rome was too far immersed in pagan worship and idolatry, Constantine moved his imperial capital east to Byzantium, a small Greek colony on the shores of the Bosporus Strait, at the fringes of Europe, overlooking Asia. The New Rome, he called it. Later, in his honor, it was renamed Constantinople, the city of Constantine. His dream gave birth to a Christian realm that provided the means for the ultimate integration of Christianity and Hellenism. Constantine himself was baptized only on his deathbed, but he had always regarded Christianity as the empire's privileged religion. Much later, in the fourth century, 50 years after his death, Constantine's favorable policies toward the church were finally carried through to completion. By decree of Emperor Theodosius the Great in the East and Emperor Gratian in the West, pagan worship was outlawed and Christianity was established as the state religion of the Roman Empire. Together, hand in hand, church and state prospered to become the glory that was the Christian Byzantine Empire. Constantinople, the cradle of Byzantine power and culture, flourished to become perhaps the most civilized city in the history of Christianity. It blended Hellenistic and Christian elements with a refinement that eloquently expressed itself in philosophy, theology, society, the law, government, scholarship, and the art. The 
Byzantine integration of Hellenism and Christianity, church and state, gave rise to the longest lasting dynasty in the history of mankind. For an unprecedented 1,000 years, Byzantine civilization dominated the history of the world, its impact still being felt today.